Well, we begin a new series today, church, called Two Paths and Your Response to Jesus. What are you going to do with Jesus? There are some Bibles in the back available for you. If you need a Bible, you can follow along or you can pull it up on your, your device or on the screen. The text will be there. We'll be in John chapter 3. And we're looking at the testimonies of the people who met Jesus. There were two individuals in John chapter 3 and John chapter 4. It's fascinating. Two characters. One's a man, one's a woman. One comes at night, one comes during the day. And John is the writer, and he's very intentional on how he describes the two interactions with Jesus. And let me just say, no matter where you're from, no matter what you've done, no matter who you are, you can have an encounter with Jesus, face-to-face -face with Jesus. John, different than the other Gospels, there's four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. One is not like the others. John is not like the other Gospels. The other Gospels are called the Synoptic Gospels. That means they share information, they share a lot of the same parables and stories and miracles. Matthew, Mark, and Luke do that. They were written earlier. John, the fourth gospel, comes much later, around 85, 90, and very different. John focuses on seven miracles of Jesus. John focuses on the seven I am statements of Jesus. And he talks a lot about the deity of Jesus. So his whole point in writing the book of John is to, to show that Jesus is not just a man. He's, he's God. He's the son of God. He's fully God. He's also fully man, but he focuses, John focuses on him being fully God. And so we sang the song, My Testimony. Two characters we're going to look at. Both had an encounter with Jesus. Jesus meets them at very different places in their life. But Jesus meets them where they are. For you today, Jesus meets you where you are today. If you have any questions about who Jesus is, if you have any questions about faith, religion, life, Jesus is, Boulder Mountain, you can come to Jesus with that. Anytime, Jesus is willing to meet with you. For followers of Jesus in the room today, if anybody ever comes to you and asks you a question about your faith, about the hope that you have, about, hey, why, I've been watching you, you're just a little different than everybody else, spend the time to meet with them. Do not put that off. That is urgent. And I would make the case, two people come to you. One knows Jesus, one doesn't know Jesus. You have a priority to the person who doesn't know Jesus. There's an urgency in the person who doesn't know Jesus to meet with them. Right? Does that mean you love the other person less? No. It means Jesus left the 99 who knew him to find the one and chase the one who didn't. And so today we begin a series that's going to take us through the month of November, looking at two characters, John chapter 3, John chapter 4. Fascinating comparisons. Every week we'll be hearing a testimony from an individual in our church. There's two types of testimonies. There's the testimony of when I was born again, of when I gave my life to Jesus, when I looked to Jesus and he saved me. Some of us know that date. We might have it written in our Bible or we have it, we know it. Just like we know our birth dates, we know our born again dates. What does it mean to be born again? We're going to talk about that. That's, that's one testimony. Then there's the other testimony that we all could have 10,000 mini testimonies of how God has worked in our life. The different examples and stories of how God showed up and when I needed him, there was a situation and he moved and worked in my life. That's also a testimony. And we all have testimonies. We all have stories. We're, our job is not to sell anyone on anything. It's to simply tell our story. No one can argue with your story of how you met Jesus. And if you haven't met Jesus yet, I'm so glad you're here. You too have a story. You have a story. And God's going to use your story. God cares about you and loves you, and he's not done speaking to you. In our church this morning, I'm inviting Cindy Stevens to come on up. And Cindy, member of our church, she's going to come and share a testimony of what God has done in her life recently. I'm so proud of Cindy. 
it takes some courage and boldness to, to share your story. So thank you, Cindy. Thank you, Kyle. Good morning. Uh, I'm Cindy Stevens, and um, I'm going to share just a little snippet of my testimony today. Um, in my early 30s, I became a, a single mom. I didn't see that coming, but um, sadly, I uh, was separated from my husband, and I had three young children, and um, to my surprise, I was in financial despair. Um, it was quite a challenge. Um, I was a new Christian, just started going to church, um, found Jesus, and gave my life over, um, and I was kind of like, what's going on here? Um, but God showed up, and in really big ways. Um, I was attending a church and um, feeling a little bit lost, not quite knowing what to do. I was now, you know, going through a divorce and trying to raise these three children on my own. And there were some amazing women that came beside me and helped me um, during this time. God had really blessed me by surrounding me with other Christian women. And during that period of time, um, I was struggling to figure out how we were going to get through Christmases. Um, it's so important for the children, you know, to have a great Christmas. And um, uh, somebody from the church came to me and said, hey, we're going to start this new ministry. Um, and we would like to bless you and your children um, and want to show you, um, you know, kind of what, what we're going to do. We're going to purchase some gifts for you guys and help you through the season. It was amazing. What what a blessing that time was. I really struggled, and um, God's fingerprints were all over my life at that time. It was terrifying, but it was okay because I knew that he was with me. And fast forward a long time. Um, I'm now remarried. My children are wonderful. They're all uh, married or engaged and um, are thriving. Uh, they're doing great. And uh, I have a grandbaby, a uh, four-year-old granddaughter that I absolutely love. Uh, so God has truly blessed me uh, through the seasons of my life. I, I could tell a lot of stories. Um, but about a year ago, um, I started attending Boulder Mountain. I really felt God leading me to do something a little bit different, but I didn't quite know what that was. I um, was praying about it and said, you know, God, what kind of ministry do you want me to be part of? And uh, when I started coming to Boulder Mountain, um, Pastor Kyle reached out to me a couple months ago and said, hey, how would you like to be part of a new ministry? And when you ask God to show you, he shows up in big ways, in really scary ways, <laughs> but nonetheless in big ways. Um, so in Pastor Kyle's message to me, he said, hey, we've got some families that are struggling, um, and the, the Christmas season is coming up, and would you be willing to lead a Christmas blessing um, within the church? And I was like, uh, okay, I was shocked um, because it had come full circle. God showed up. He was using me um, in ways that I never know, knew that he could, and it was, it was pretty amazing. So I said, okay, I don't really know what I'm doing, but we'll, we'll go with it. Uh, so I recruited some folks, um, Carol and, and Greg Caton, who are amazing, um, and a couple of others that are kind of helping me along this journey. Um, but we now have a Christmas blessing, and um, it's to help those within our church that might be struggling financially. It could be single parents. It could be um, those families that are just going through a hard time, uh, especially after COVID, right? A lot of folks have, have lost their job. Or it could be widows. So, um, you know, we've got this Christmas blessing going on. Um, we've got some uh, fl flyers in the back. So if you have a financial need, we would like to bless you. Um, there's some information on the back where you can go to the website and fill out a form and just let us know what your needs are. On the flip side of that, 
We are an amazing congregation that is very generous. And I would like to ask that during this season, if you have been blessed by God, would you please help? Uh, we, we're looking for financial support. So we have on our website, there's a way to give if you'd like to give money. But we also have a Christmas blessing tree in the back. So there are some tags if you're familiar with the angel tree. Uh, you can pull a tag off there and uh, we'll write down your name in information. And we're just asking you to purchase the item that's on the tag. You bring it back to the church unwrapped and uh, we will bless the families that need that help. So um, we're just asking for everybody to kind of come together and help our church family. We definitely reach out to the community and we support them, but this is a way for us to come together as a congregation and help those within our church. So I would ask that you help us. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. And let me just say, I'm, I'm really proud of you. I did not know her story. I didn't have any context of that. And reached out, and God's at work in her. That's her testimony. It's part of her testimony. She, just, she said, there's, there's much more there. You have a testimony. God's, God's working, and as long as we have breath, God's not done working in, in us. And Cindy, if you, if you caught that, she's blessed to be a blessing. She was blessed, did not stop there. Now she gets the opportunity to lead the ministry that she was received in. Uh, that's, that's incredible. And I'm, I'm so proud of you. Thank you for, for that. Nicodemus is the gentleman we're looking at today. And God's working in his life. In John chapter 3, verse 1, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. Now, we talked about Pharisees in the book of Acts. When we went through the book of Acts, the series that we just came out of. Nicodemus is wealthy. He's got power. He has influence. There's about 6,000 Pharisees at the time that John's writing this. Many were part of the Sanhedrin, the group that actually tried and crucified Christ. Nicodemus is his name, a ruler of the Jews. He's wealthy. Oftentimes, there's this belief that only the broken and the emotional and the weak come to Jesus. I don't know if you've ever heard that, just talk about that in our culture. I don't, I don't need religion in my life. Yeah, I don't either. I need a relationship with Jesus. But oftentimes that's, that's said, Nicodemus is not emotional. He's, he's not poor. He's, he's wealthy. He's not one of little power. He has great influence and, and influence and power. Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him. So we can make the case here. John doesn't explain why Nicodemus came to Jesus that night. We could imply, we could think that he didn't want to be seen. Some of us want to come to Jesus in private. We're not ready to go public yet. Our faith is very personal. Our faith was never meant to be private, but it's personal. John doesn't tell us that's why he came, to, but he mentions it so we can infer. If we were in a court of law, somebody would say objection because we don't know for sure that that's why he came to Jesus that night. But I think there's a, there's a good indication. It's a Pharisee. He, he wouldn't want to be seen by other Pharisees working with, talking to Jesus, the enemy. Right? Now, now, Nicodemus was, had high pedigree he trained under the best of the best of the best. He, was, he went to the MIT school of rabbinical training. Right? And he comes to Jesus who does not have the rabbinical training. He does not have the pedigree. Right? And he calls him. This is, so, this is fascinating. What does he say to him? His first word, ruler, this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi. So God's at work in Nicodemus. Why? Because he's ascribing to him as a peer. God's doing something in Nicodemus. Before we meet Jesus, before any of us in the room have met Jesus or before one day we might meet Jesus, God's already at work. 
We sang the song 10,000 Reasons. There are 10,000 things God is doing in this very moment right now to draw you to himself. God was at work in the life of Nicodemus. Rabbi, he calls him rabbi. We know that you're a teacher come from God for no one can do these things. No one can do these signs that you do unless God is with them. So he can't argue the fact. You've done some supernatural work. I can see that. I've witnessed that. I want to know more. Friends, do you, live in a, do you live your life in such a way that people say, I want to know more? I, I see things in your life. I, I've witnessed you. I've been watching you so often. There are people who are searching for purpose in their life, and they're looking at you, and they say, you have purpose in your life. I want to know more. I'm, I'm confident they're watching you. Nicodemus was watching Jesus from a distance. Now he takes the next step to say, can I meet with you at night? I don't know if it's 9 p.m. at night, if it's midnight. I don't know if it's middle of the night. But it's middle, it's, it's at night. And Jesus answers him. You come to Jesus with your questions, he will answer you. He will give you the time. There will never be a moment where Jesus is not ready and willing to meet with you. Anytime, day, we'll see in John chapter 4, or night. Middle of the desert or outside the synagogue late at night. You pick the location. You pick the time. You pick the environment. You pick whatever circumstance is going on in your life. And you know what? Jesus says, I'll meet you there. Jesus will meet you there. You have questions about what does it mean to be saved? What does it mean to be born again? What does it mean to give your life to him? He'll meet you there. And the, the text, the context of this, Oftentimes we read this passage and we think maybe he's talking to a crowd. Jesus is eye to eye with Nicodemus. Maybe they were sitting down. In that case, they're eye to eye and knee to knee. Intimate conversation. Nicodemus was not a follower. Nicodemus is actually the enemy. Jesus knows Nicodemus is part of the group of people that are going to kill him in a little bit. And Jesus says, yeah, I'll meet with you. What questions do you have? And Jesus says, listen, I'm going to tell you the truth here. And I, I envision Jesus just being so gentle. He's not condescending, not condemning. He's not critical. He's like, do you want to hear the truth? I want to tell you the truth. My goal is that everyone, no one would ever leave here and say, but you never told me. One day when we stand before Jesus, that you would never say, but I was never told this. Why didn't you tell me this? So Jesus said, I'm going to be honest with you. Do you want to know the truth? Truly, truly, I tell you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. We've heard that term before, born again. It's taken on different connotations in our culture. It's, it can be heavy. It can be political. But Jesus is the one who comes up with the term first. Born again. Now, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, anytime they talk about coming to faith, entering into the kingdom, they used an illustration like the seed being germinated, being fallen on the soil. And the seed's going to take root, or it's going to be eaten by birds, or it's going to be blown away, or it's going to be caught up in thorns. This illustration, you might have heard of this illustration, but when Jesus is eye to eye with another person, Jesus gets personal. And he doesn't use, he doesn't say, you need, how has the seed fallen on your life, Nicodemus? He says, unless you are born again. Now, everyone in the room, we have a shared experience. We've all been born. There was an experience where we were born, every one of us in the room. Whether you say you were or not, you were born. There was a moment, I don't know if you were born in a barn, in a car on the way to the hospital, in a hospital, in a clinic. I don't know where you were in a, I know hot tubs are a thing now. Maybe you were born in the water. I don't know. But we were all born. And here's the other thing we have in common. None of us had anything to do with it. You didn't have anything to do with your birth. You didn't have to work hard at your birth. You, there was nothing you did in that moment. Someone else did a lot, but you didn't do anything. So Jesus says, unless you're born again. And Nicodemus hears that. He's like, okay, I've been born. I get that. And there's born of water and born of the spirit. 
In Ezekiel 36, in Isaiah, it talks about water being representative of the Holy Spirit. Right? Water in the desert, new life. When you talk about the Holy Spirit, there's several analogies. Water, we also talk about the wind. We sang that in the song this morning. The wind, when we say that, blow, God, Holy Spirit, blow into this room. Create new life. Regenerate me. And so Nicodemus hears this, and he's, he's a smart dude. Nicodemus is like a doctorate level, right? He's a smart guy. But then he says, uh, how can a man be born when he's old? Help me. I don't, I don't get this. I don't know where you're going. You lost me. How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter, his, can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? It's a fair question. When Jesus says you must be born again, Jesus answered, let me tell you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, water, okay, natural birth. Sometimes we, we hear the phrase, and I'm not a doctor, but I know when the water breaks, there's something going on, right? Uh-oh, water breaks. What is it? What's that a sign of? New life is about to happen here. There's a child about to enter into the world. It's a big deal when the water breaks. Natural birth, water, right? Spirit, and then he says, unless you're born of water, natural birth, and the spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. And you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And what's, what's John, as he's writing this, he's writing the narration of what Jesus, the conversation he had with Nicodemus. What's he getting at here? Some of us in the room have heard the gospel a hundred times. And it had, the penny hasn't dropped yet. I've talked to a number of people over, over my life who said, you know, I grew up in a church and I never heard the gospel. And then I heard it when I was 38 and then boom, it, it made sense to me. And I've heard that story enough that there's, there's probably two scenarios. One is, yeah, the church was not preaching the gospel. That, that's, that could be one of the options. That, that is true today. There are churches that do not preach the good news of Jesus, that you are saved by faith and faith alone. But then there's also the case that you might have heard the gospel, but you are not hearing the gospel. Many environments and opportunities where people hear the gospel, but there's no, there's no response to it. So we can hear the gospel, but not, not be hearing the gospel. And so God's at work in Nicodemus to the point where he's asking these questions. And the spirit comes and goes. There are times God has moved in your life where you least expected it. That's, just, that's the wind blowing. You know what, what just happened? You're moved. God's doing this new, giving you new life. And so it is with everyone who's born of the spirit. But Nicodemus says to him, how, how can this be? I, I believe you and I have a lot in common with Nicodemus. It is so easy to look at a character of scripture like Nicodemus and think, oh, I can't believe you didn't get that. We have a lot in common with Nicodemus. Nicodemus thought that his good works played a part in saving him. I think Nicodemus thought his good works got him to a certain point and maybe Jesus could help get him over the finish line. Nicodemus says to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel and yet you don't understand these things? He's saying, you should know this. Nicodemus, you should know this. Are you the teacher? Truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And then he goes in to verse 14. He says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whoever believes in him may have eternal life. The next verse may be familiar, even if you're not from church, even if you didn't grow up in church, even if... This may be the first time you've ever been to church. I'm so glad you're here. But it's a verse that makes its appearance at World Series games and Super Bowls and a lot of sporting events, and it's usually a big yellow 
billboard, that's the verse John 3.16. And that verse was originally said by Jesus eye to eye with Nicodemus. Eye to eye with an enemy who one day was going to be part of the group that tries and kills Jesus. And he says to him, Nicodemus, for God so loved the world. Nicodemus, I loved you so much that God gave his only son. I'm that son. I'm him. Nicodemus, I'm Jesus. I'm the son of God. That if you, Nicodemus, believe in me, just simply believe in me, all your works are like filthy rags. You will not perish, but you'll have everlasting life. That's the context of John 3.16. It should always be said in the context of John 3.17 as well. That's a less familiar verse, but just as powerful. John 3.17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Nicodemus, I don't condemn you. I know you're going to stab me in the back. I know you're part of these groups trying to get me, but I'm having an eye to eye with you. And as I see you right now, I don't condemn you. Jesus does not condemn the world. It's not his goal. It's not why he came. You and I do not need to condemn the world. As we follow Jesus, we're to represent Jesus. We're not to condemn our neighbors. We're not to condemn the enemy. People are not the enemy. We're not con- not to condemn the world. Why? Because God did not send Jesus to the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. My prayer is that the world be saved. That should be your prayer as well. My prayer is, if you don't know Jesus, that today, November 5th, 2023, would be the day where you are reborn. Today's the day of salvation. There's a famous preacher named Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Charles Haddon Spurgeon was so famous that when he preached in London, England, they printed every sermon in the newspaper the next day, and they ran out of papers. Could you imagine that in our culture? Sermons were printed in the paper. But he didn't know Jesus at the age of 15. He was trying to become a Christian. He was trying to figure out all, he thought there were 500 things he needed to do to become a Christian. A winter storm blows in, a blizzard blows into London. He couldn't go to his Baptist church that he was attending. So he goes to the nearest church by his house, which is a small Methodist church. The storm kept everybody away. There were five people there. The pastor couldn't get there. So a layman gets up to give the sermon. Spurgeon says it was an awful sermon. But he references a text in Isaiah that says, look, God says, all ye earth, this is in King James, all ye earth look to me and you will be saved. That was the verse. Look to me and you will be saved. That was the verse. And then the man said a few words at it. And as he's preaching, he looks at Haddon sitting in the front row. And he says, son, you look miserable. And you will be miserable the rest of your life unless you look to Jesus for salvation. And Spurgeon gave his life to Jesus that day. He was looking for 500 different things to to save himself. He was looking for things to do. What must I do to be saved? And the man who spoke that day told Charles Spurgeon, you don't even have to lift a finger. Just look to Jesus and you will be saved. Tim Keller tells the story of a woman who came into his office and said she had five identities throughout the course of her life. She said, I grew up in church and I was told that if I was really, really, really good, God would love me. So she was very moral. And she says, I turned into a self-righteous Pharisee. And so she left that church And she was told, hey, you need to start dating. So she starts dating. She's looking for her identity in in other men. Romantic relationships. She believed the Frank Sinatra song that you're nobody until someone loves you. And so she became, chased all these relationships. Some of them were unhealthy. Some of them were abusive. And she recognized, well, that's not where my purpose is found. And then a, a friend came to her and says, you know what your problem is? You're looking for men to save you, but you need to save yourself. You need to become an independent, individualistic, strong, liberated woman. So she goes to school. She gets a career. She's proud of the fact that she's now an independent woman. She's edu- educated, and then she loses her job. And then someone comes and says, well, your problem is, you know what you really need to do? You need to start serving. You need to start serving in homeless shelters. You need to, start, need to go into prison ministry and start serving with, with other women. And she became exhausted. And then she hears the gospel. For the first time, she hears the gospel. 
And she recognizes, oh, I, I can't save myself. And this is what she says. First, I thought I was somebody because I was moral, because I was a good person. Anyone in the room think, think God saves you because you're good? Then I thought I was somebody because I was beautiful. Then I thought I was someone because I was successful. Then I thought I was someone because I was helpful. Then she heard the gospel. What happens when someone is born again, two things. One is there's new sensibilities that occur. The other is there's a new identity. We talk about new sensibilities. When a baby is in the womb, baby can hear voices. When a baby comes up out of the womb, it's clear. What was muffled before now becomes so clear. A baby cannot see in the womb. When the baby comes out into the world, it sees clearly. When, when you come to know Jesus, everything changes. St. Augustine says, all my loves were rearranged when you come to know Jesus. What you first thought was top priority in your life becomes rearranged. Now God is my top priority in my life. And now I don't look to other people and jobs and careers and industries and everything else to find my purpose and fulfillment. That is found in Jesus. If my, if my wife is my number one in my life without God, that would, the expectations on her and on me would break us. Because I would look for so much affirmation from her. But now when that comes from God, there's freedom in our relationship. St. Augustine all my loves are rearranged when I come to know Jesus. So our sensibilities, maybe you've experienced this. When you came to know Jesus, the, the, the light went off. The penny dropped. The scales were lifted. And you see things through a much different filter. Everything changes. Not immediately. Not immediately. But over time, you begin to see things differently. No one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. You hear what Jesus says here. Until you're born again. That's why it's hard to have conversations with people about faith who don't know Jesus. You can share your story. Really important. If you've never written your testimony, write your testimony. It's important to do. Who you were before Jesus, what happened when you met Jesus, and what's happened since. Then the identity piece. When a baby's born in most of the world, not in Western culture, but most of the world, when a baby's born, born into the most significant part of that is they're born into a family. A family name is everything. And with that family name comes expectations and pressure. In our Western culture, so you have that, you have identity, family name. The, in our Western culture, it's, no, you, we grow up to be taught, become an individual, and it's about you, and you save yourself. So right. Neither one will save you. The pressure of a family name won't save you, and the pressure of you trying to save yourself won't save you. The only one who can save you is the unconditional love of Jesus. John chapter 3, what does Jesus reference to Nicodemus? Nicodemus would have known the Exodus 21 story. What happens is the nation of Israel is sinning against God. Surprise, I know, shocker on that one. But what God does is he sends a plague of snakes. And the snakes run through the camp and they begin biting the nation of Israel, the Jewish people. And so what happens? Moses hears from God to tell the people, look at the bronze serpent. If you look at the bronze serpent, you will be saved. You'll be healed. You don't even have to go and touch it. You don't have to rub yourself against it. You just have to look at it. Just look at it and you'll be saved. You don't have to look a, lift a finger. Look at it and you'll be saved. The venom running through their veins analogy here is the sin that runs through all of us. It's broken us. It's wounded our soul. And how are you saved from that? You can't save yourself. And so how are you, how are you saved from that? When Spurgeon was in the church, that verse in, in Isaiah, look to me and you will be saved. He took those words and he placed them in the words of Jesus. Look to me when I'm bleeding drops of blood in the garden. Look to me, Jesus says, when I'm on the cross, giving my life for me. Look to me when I'm rolled into the, the tomb. Look to me when I've rose again. Look to me when I'm in heaven, ascended. Look to Jesus for salvation. You and I are saved by faith and grace alone, not of works, lest any man should boast. So what's happening when, it, when we talk about being born again? In Jesus' time, 
There were not things like epidurals. Uh, young men in the room, if you don't know what an epidural is, ask a woman who's sitting next to you. They'll tell you what an epidural is. There, there weren't IVs. There weren't medicine and painkillers and all that. And the risk when you went to give birth was great that women would not survive that birth experience. And so every time a woman went into labor, there was the risk. You know, we read it in the history books, the mortality rate of women giving birth. There was the risk of the mom saying, my life for my child. They were willing to risk that, well, their life so that the child might have new life. They were willing to do that. Now, all of us in the room, when I was born, it was pretty easy. I just came out. Each of our three girls, I remember I was there watching all three of them, very, very different. One of them came out screaming. One of them came out really quiet. And one of them came out hungry. It's one to eat. Very different. But relate that to being born again. What does it mean to be born again? None of us had any role in our birth, but somebody did. Somebody in that room, when you were born, was going through great agonizing pain and suffering so that you might have life. In much the same way, when we are reborn, when we are born again, there was, that came with a great cost. There was great suffering and there was great pain. Jesus didn't even risk his life. He gave his life so that we might have new life in him. That's the regeneration of the Holy Spirit working in our life. And some of us would say, well, you know, I, I heard you just have to repent and be sorry for your sins and believe in Jesus. Yes, that's a part of it, but drill it down deeper. Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. Just as the Son of Man was lifted high up. That's how you're saved. It's not what you've done. It's not what you haven't done. It's not, well, Jesus, here's all my works. Here it is. Look to Jesus and you'll be saved. And Nicodemus, look to Jesus, you'll be saved. Nicodemus turns and walks away. That's the end of the conversation. We, we don't know how that all ended. But I'm so grateful it's not the last that we hear of Nicodemus. How do you know that a person's said yes to Jesus, that they've given their life to Jesus because of a changed life, right? We're saved by faith alone, but it's, it's not a, a faith that is alone. Does that make sense? We're saved by faith alone, but the rest of our life, we walk in faith and it's going to produce a changed life. We heard about it today. It's, Jesus changed a woman. She's telling you her story. There's many others in the room. There's been a changed life, and we're going to see Nicodemus later on in the Gospel of John. Nicodemus is not done with Jesus. And Jesus, more importantly, is not done with Nicodemus. And friend, if you don't know Jesus, he's not done with you. He will continue to show up in your life. He'll continue to talk to you. He'll continue to be made available to you. He's just saying, look at me, and you'll be saved. Look to Jesus and you'll be born again. He desires that for you. Would you pray with me? Father, as we come to this time of the service where we're going to remember the great sacrifice and cost, your suffering, your pain, your agony, so that we might be born again. I thank you for that date. Some of us in the room, we know that date. We thank you for that date. And for some in the room, if, if they haven't been born again, if they haven't looked to Jesus for salvation, that November 5th would be that date. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for the opportunity we have to commune together, community, communion, as we remember the Lord's Supper and we come to the table. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm so glad that you joined us for today's service. Let me leave you with a few next steps that you can take. Number one, let us know that you're participating online. You can make a comment there in the notes. You can send me an email or you can give the church a call. Just let us know. We'd love to add you to our email list that updates our people on what is happening in the life of the church. Number two, if there's something I can specifically be praying for you about, I can give that prayer request. I will pray for you, but I can also give that to our prayer team. A third next step that you can take, if you've been encouraged by the ministry of Boulder Mountain, even though you've maybe never been here physically, 
Uh, let me encourage you to give. We believe that giving teaches us contentment. When we recognize that God's been generous to us, so at Boulder Mountain, we give first, we save second, then we live on the rest. So there's an opportunity for you to participate in giving through our church website. If there's anything else that I can be doing for you or, or Boulder Mountain can do for you by sending you resources, simply let us know. Otherwise, let me pray for you as we close our service. And so for those, Father, who are not here in the room, we recognize church is not a building we come and sit in. So wherever they are at, we know and we believe that, Jesus, you are with them. So I pray that they would sense your presence and your power. Holy Spirit, give them the wisdom to know what to do and then give them the courage to do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you this week.